Okay, so this is part two, and we'll have sections two and three. So we're going to start introducing the um, well-known non-symmetric probabilistic binary channel model for testing. And this is what we often use in wireless communications. So let's see how it can help us understand testing for coronavirus. So first of all, we have to. I want to introduce the idea of false positive and false negative. So which is the more dangerous, a false positive or a false negative? And the answer is it all depends. So if I'm looking at, for example, um, virus detection, false negative would seem to be the worst because if you tell someone that they don't have the virus, uh, but they actually do, false negative, then they go out and infect other people. If you are false positive, you tell them that they have the virus, but they don't, well, they just isolate themselves for a week or two weeks. So it's not quite as much of a problem. If you're doing antibody detection, uh, false positive would seem to be the worst because you uh, test positive uh, and it looks as though that you're now immune to the virus so you head off uh, and uh, you take risks and you can get infected. If you're looking at nuclear missile detection then it would seem both are serious. A false positive means that you detect an incoming missile uh, where there isn't one and you launch uh, nuclear missiles against um, other countries and obliterate them when you haven't actually been attacked. A false negative is um, where you say there is no missile coming in but there actually is and you get nuked and obliterated. So uh, there is no simple answer, it depends on what is the application. So introduction to nomenclature, what are true positive, true negative, false positive and false negative? So let's take a simple example. Let's look at diabetes prediction from concentration of glucose in blood. Let's assume 60% of the population have diabetes and 40% do not, just, just for simplicity. I'm not saying this is the situation. And we're going to use a little smiley face for someone who has no diabetes and a crying face for someone who has diabetes. So if we take a blood glucose level and we set a threshold, and at the top, we have those people who test positive, and at the bottom, we have those who test negative. So here's the first person who has no diabetes, and they correctly test negative. Here's the second person who has diabetes, and they correctly test positive. The next person uh, tests negative, they don't have diabetes, and so on. Until we get to this, well, these two guys here, sorry, these two, this one. So this one has diabetes and tests negative, which is wrong. Uh, that one's OK. Uh, that one's wrong because that's someone who has no diabetes but tests positive. And that one's fine. And that one is OK. So you can say that in the bottom left hand corner, that's a true and a negative. So we're looking at the green. These are all the negatives. That's a true negative. Uh, that's a false negative, that's a false negative, and that's a true negative. Now let's look at the positives. That's a true positive, a true positive, a true positive, a false positive, and a true positive. So now from that, uh, what we can say is we have eight conditional probabilities. So we have 60% of the population of diabetes and 40% did not. So within the country, the following test probabilities. Uh, the number of true positives is four, you can count those. The number of true negatives is three. The number of false positives is one, and the number of false negatives is two. So 40% are true po positives, 30% uh, true negatives, and 10% false positives, and 20% false negatives. So now you can do this simple conditional probability. Um, I, I can't show my cursor because of the way I'm recording this on the screen, so if you look at the first line where it says probability you will test positive and that vertical line means conditioned on you have diabetes so the probability that you're going to test positive conditioned on that you have diabetes is the number of true positives which is uh, four over the number uh, six now where do we get the six from where do we get the four from so we're looking at the probability that you'll test positive given that you have diabetes so many people have got diabetes. There are six little crying faces. And the number that will test positive of those six are four. There are four crying faces in the pink area. So we get four over six. 
So there's a 67% chance that you will test positive, given that you have diabetes. Likewise, what's the probability you will test negative, given that you have diabetes? Again, six little crying faces who have diabetes, and many of those land in the green area. We have got two, so we've got two over six. So there you can get um, four conditional probabilities, and now there's eight in total. Uh, so what we do here is we simply take each one of those four and we interchange uh, the two conditions. So the first one is probability you will test positive, conditioned on you have diabetes. We'll change that around and say probability that you have diabetes, given that you will test positive. So, okay, we'll now look at the other four conditional probabilities. These are the posterior probabilities. <clears throat> These are after the test has happened. So that's the data we already know. And here are the four additional conditional probabilities. Let's look at the first one. The probability that you have diabetes, given that you test positive. And uh, so what we do there is we look at all those who've tested positive. So in the pink area, there are five faces. So that's why five is on the denominator. And you have diabetes is the number of crying faces within the pink area. And that is the number of true positives, which is four. So we get four over five, which gives you 0.8. And you do the same for every other one of those posterior probabilities, the other three. Um, and so you get uh, four results, which gives you eight conditional probabilities in total. So we can draw this binary channel model because it's much easier, I think, to visualize this. And this is from engineering. So what we've got on the left hand side are the inputs, the probability that you have diabetes and the probability that you don't have diabetes. And then what we've got on the right hand side is the probability that you test positive, the outputs and the problem. And if we want to work out the probability that you test positive, it's the probability that you have diabetes times the probability you will test positive, given that you have diabetes plus the probability that you don't have diabetes times the probability you will test positive given that you don't have diabetes. So that's how you get the outcome probability that you test positive. You get true positives, the people who have diabetes coming through, and you get false positives, the people who don't have diabetes coming through. Likewise, for the output probability you will test negative, you get that coming in two different ways. You get the true negatives coming in and you get the false negatives coming in. So there you are. We've introduced now true positives, true negatives, false positives and false negatives. So now let's go back to COVID. So we're not looking at um, glucose and diabetes. We're going to look at COVID and we're going to have a slight change in nomenclature. So what we really have is we have a, COVID, a test for COVID-19. We have someone who comes in uh, with crying face who's infected, I and someone who's not infected, smiley face. The output is either positive uh, or negative. So one person who's either infected or not infected takes the test and gets either a positive output or a negative output, neither of which is 100% accurate because of false positives and false negatives. Okay, let's have a look at the physical test process because we don't want some abstract model. We want to see how it relates to the actual physical testing. So you take a swab, and from that swab, you try to extract viral RNA, and then you put it into the um, PCR machine. At each stage, there are errors that can be introduced. So when you get an output which is positive or negative, each one of those is uh, not going to be 100% certain. So you map that onto the uh, non-symmetric uh, probabilistic binary uh, channel. And... Uh, if you include the priors, which is the prevalence of the disease, the probability that you're infected, then from that you can get another uh, four uh, conditional probabilities, posterior probabilities, that is after the test has taken place, as well as an expression for the test accuracy. Okay, so let's have a look at these parameters and let's explain them. So what we've got here is we've got the prior probabilities. So they're in red. It's the probability of being infected or the probability of being not infected. 
Um, this is the, the probability that someone, say, picked from random the population is infected, PR of i, or probably they're not infected, which is 1 minus PR of i. And uh, this is called the population prevalence. The other thing that we have in our uh, little diagram above is the sensitivity, also called the true positive rate. And that's the probability that you test positive conditioned on you being infected. So that's in blue at the very top. And this is um, how sensitive the test is to the presence of the virus. And ideally, you'd want that to be close to one. Um, now, going down diagonally from left to right, you have PR probability that you test negative conditioned on you being infected. And that uh, and PRPI in blue have to add to one. So if we take uh, in green um, the probability that you test negative given that you're not infected, that's called the true negative rate, TNR, and it's also called the specificity. So specificity, just like sensitivity, are words that epidemiologists use. And again, rather than trying to remember these, they should make sense. Specificity says really is, it's the problem, it's about how specific is the test of COVID-19. So if the virus is, is not present, then the specificity, the, the green bit, if, sorry, if, if the virus is not present, the test should not detect it. So ideally that should be close to one. So if everything was working properly, the two blue probabilities, blue probability and the green probability would both be one and the diagonal probabilities would be zero because they give you the false negatives and the false positives. Okay, let's go through some of the other parameters. So again, I've highlighted these, uh, one in red and one in green, and I've already alluded to them. So this is the false positive rate, and it's called a type one error. And it's the probability that uh, you will test positive given that you're not infected. So that's the diagonal going from left to right. Okay, and ideally that should be close to zero. And the green uh, parameter going from top left to bottom right is the false negative rate or type two error. And it's the probability that you're, uh, you get a negative given that you're infected. Okay, and ideally that should be close to zero. Now, we only need three parameters to completely define the testing problem. And these are the uh, highlighted and uh, enlarged font. Uh, if you have any one of those, you can find all the others, because as I've explained before, there's always two that add up to one. And um, I've chosen those as examples. You could have chosen uh, the probability of not being infected, and you could have chosen the diagonal uh, parameters. So once you have, um, once you have got this, you can then work out the posterior probabilities, uh, which depend on the priors. So at the moment, uh, we haven't worked out anything that depends on the priors, but here we're now starting to look, and these are not shown in the figures because you have to have a formula for them. So uh, taking into account the priors, uh, probably that you're infected, then we have the precision or positive predictive value, PPI. And that's the probability that you're infected given that you test positive. So you go in and have a test, you test positive, and you say, hey, what's the probability that I'm actually infected? And it's how reliable is, is a positive test. And ideally, that should be equal to one. You'd like to say you're 100% uh, probability, 100% probability of being infected if you test positive. The other one, again, which is not shown on the figure, but we have to have a formula for that, is called the negative predictive value. So this is like um, the probability that you're not infected given that you test negative. And it's about how reliable is a negative test. And again, that should be equal to one. So two more posterior probabilities. Posterior meaning uh, after the test has taken place. So false discovery rate. And that's the probability that you're not infected given that you've tested positive. Okay. 
So we're talking about false positives here. The probability that you, uh, given that you've uh, tested positive, what's the probability that that's going to be a false positive, i.e. you're not infected. And finally, you have the false submission rate. So that's the probability that you're infected, given that you tested negative, and that's a false negative. Now there's quite a lot, there's four uh, posterior probabilities with acronyms and with names that should make sense. So don't try to remember those, try to, to make sense that they do. The words have meaning, false emission rate and false discovery rate. Okay, so let's just derive those four posterior probabilities. And all you've got to do is use Bayes' law and the law of total probability. Or you could do it much simpler. You could just look at the figure above and derive it uh, almost uh, intuitively. But if we use Bayes' law, and I'm not going to go over this because you will have been taught this in your first year or at school, then the PPV, that is the probability that you're infected given that you've, uh, you test positive. So <clears throat> we write Bayes' law, and then we expand the denominator using the law of total probability, and we get this expression. Uh, and then we can say that uh, the probability that you're not infected uh, conditioned on you testing positive is simply 1 minus uh, the PPV. And you can do exactly the same for uh, the NPV, the probability that you're not infected given that you test negative. And so there you have all the four posterior probabilities. And we've written those in terms of the parameters on the binary model plus the priors. So other parameters that depend on the priors, you can look at the probability of being an error. And you can work that out just by looking at that model. The probability of being an error is the probability that you're infected and you go down the diagonal from left to right, plus the probability that you're not infected and you go up the diagonal from left to uh, left bottom to top right. And the, prob the accuracy um, well, it's just uh, in exactly the same way. It's the probability that you're infected um, times the probability that you test positive given that you're infected. So that's going along the top horizontal line and uh, likewise along the bottom horizontal line. And that gives you the probability of, that gives you the accuracy of the actual test itself. And it's dependent on the priors. Now, if you want to improve the test, the only things that are controllable really are the four probability parameters inside that um, binary non-symmetric probabilistic model. Um, when I say only two, because the other two in black are dependent on the ones in red and in blue, because um, they will each, each two together will add to one. Now, you might argue that you can't change the prevalence. Um, and I should really have a change in nomenclature here because this is talking about the prevalence in the country. But actually, what it's going to mean is it's what is the belief when you present for your test about whether uh, the doctor uh, thinks that you may have coronavirus or, or not. Uh, at the very worst, you're taking people at random and it's just the the prevalence with inside the community. But if you come in coughing and sneezing with loss of smell and taste, then perhaps that prevalence might go up from 0.1 to 0 0.9. So uh, we will show later on that that is possibly controllable. Um, but for a practical test, there's only really one independent variable. And the reason for that is that if you try to change the uh, red one in the uh, diagram, then you affect the blue one. Uh, that's what happens in practice. Of course, you can do a simulation by setting the red and the blue to whatever you want. But in practice, if you start to change the red, you will also end up changing the blue, especially by changing thresholds, as we're going to see later on. And we'll see in section five how we can control these priors uh, for the prevalence at the, at the input. OK, so that finishes uh, section two. Now let's take section three. So section three is for examples on the posterior test probabilities. So let's take example one. <clears throat> um, a doctor will be given these uh, probabilities. They are the 
uh, sensitivity and the specificity of the test. So he or she will already know that. So assume a man walks into a doctor's surgery for a test. Um, the doctor looks at the bit in red and says to the man, quite correctly, if you are infected with the virus, then the test will give a positive result 98% of the time. That's the interpretation in words of the probability that you will test positive conditioned on you being infected. So the man tests positive and the doctor refers to what she said above in red. So she said, I'm sorry, but um, I am 98% certain that you have the virus. So the man's pretty devastated because he might have been hoping her to say, well, I'm only 20% certain or 30% certain. And the question is, is the doctor correct? We'll see it's not. So what we've got, what we really want is the probability of being infected conditioned on testing positive. Not the horizontal line with the parameter probability of testing positive, given that you're infected. So this is mixing up the a posteriori probability, which is going to depend as we're going to see in the priors. So let's assume that uh, we can work out what the uh, prevalence is. And uh, I've worked out the prevalence here as 0 0.0021. Uh, so if we use that information, um, we can then uh, work out the uh, diagonal probabilities. And we simply take those and we put it into one of the previous equations that we did a few slides ago. And we find that the probability that you're infected, given that uh, you test positive, is actually very low, 0 0.0935, which is 9.35%. So although the man tested positive, there's only a 9.35% that he's actually got. So let's look at what the doctor should have said to the patient. So the doctor knows what the prior is. Uh, she knows what the uh, sensitivity is, which is the middle part. And uh, maybe she hasn't worked out what the posterior probability is, the probability of being infected, given that you test positive. So she looked at the bit in red and she said, mistakenly, I'm very sorry, but I'm 98% certain that you have the virus. And that was incorrect, as we now know. She should have looked at the two green parts and said this. Uh, the man then tests positive and the doctor should have said, before the virus, you had a 0.21% chance of having the virus. After the positive test, that has increased to only 9.35%. So I think the man would have been very happy there. When someone walks in, the best you can do is just say, what your chances of having the virus based on the prevalence. When you take a test, the test should increase that. And ideally, uh, a positive test should increase it to one, but that's never the case. And the reason it, it's gone to 9.35 is because of the very low prior, 0 0.0021. So the doctor confused the uh, probability in red with the probability in green. And apparently this is a classic mistake of many medical students. So let's take uh, this one, example three. A diagnostic test uh, for infectious disease has a sensitivity of 67% and a specificity of 91%. And let's assume it's applied to 2030 people to look for a disorder with a population prevalence of 1.48%. Analyze the expected results. So it's always better to start with drawing this uh, little input output uh, probabilistic uh, diagram. And then what you can do is you can put in the, the values here. So sensitivity, probability that you'll test positive given that you're infected. And the specificity, probability that you'll uh, test negative given that you're not infected, which is 0.91. And then the other uh, is the prevalence. Everything else follows because the probability that you're not infected, the probability you're infected have to add up to one. The upward diagonal uh, has to be added to the blue to give you one, and the downward diagonal has to be added to the red to give you one. So now you've got all the details. Now, sometimes it's much easier to analyze this with actual numbers rather than probability. Well, not easy to analyze, but it just gives you a better insight. So if you assume that you've got 2,030 people, then the expected numbers with the disease will be 30. 
and the expected numbers without the disease would be 2,000. And you can put in all the other numbers there as well. So um, 30 are infected and 2,000 are not infected. That's on the uh, left-hand side. And then you've got a 0.67 uh, probability going horizontally uh, that you'll, you'll test as positive. So 20 of those 30 will give true positives. And uh, 10 of those 30 will give false negatives. Likewise, of the 2,000 that are not infected, um, 18, 20 will give true negatives, and uh, 18, 180 will blue will give false positives. So if you do that, you can write all this down. You can write the total number of true positives, false positives, true negatives, and false negatives. So once you've tested those 2,030 people, you can say that majority of those tests will be about 90% true negatives. Okay. So uh, you can then work out the um, other probabilities simply from that uh, illustration. Probability that you're infected conditioned on you testing positive. Now, rather than using the formula, you can simply look at that diagram. So the probability that you're infected given that you test positive. Well, 200 people test positive. Of those 200, 20 will be infected. That's the horizontal line. So 20 over 200 gives you 10%. So um, that's the, um, the PPV value. Um, the probability that you will not be infected if you, if you test positive. So 200 test positive, and many come through as not being infected. That's the false positives. That's 180 in the uh, bottom left to top right. Uh, blue line, so 180 over 200. And similarly for the other two, uh, posterior probabilities. So you get all of those. Okay, so we can analyze these results. Uh, we can say that there were 1820 plus 20 1840 correct tests. That comes from the blue horizontal number 1820 and the top black horizontal number 20, the true negatives and the true positives. So the overall accuracy without using any formula is simply 1840, total number of correct tests over 203, oh, the total number of tests. So that's 90.64% accuracy. And then we should know that the test is very poor at confirming the disease. So if you test positive, there's only a 10% probability that you have the disease. So if you look uh, at the red output testing positive, you can see 180 uh, came into that, which were false positives. So 180 false positives over 2030 would give 8.9% of all those tested uh, will undergo unnecessary treatment because there'll be 8.9% uh, false positives. The test is very good at confirming the absence of the disease. That's the NPV, which is 99.45. So that if, if you test negative, there's a 99.45% probability that you do not have uh, the disease. So poor at confirming the disease, but good at confirming the absence of the disease. And the consequence of the NPV above is that the 4 is 0.55%. So only 10 out of 2030 about 0.49% of all those tests that will incorrectly test negative and go on to infect others. And that's what you don't want to happen. You don't want a lot to um, test negative but be able to go on to infect others because it's incorrect. Okay, let's look at example four. Let's assume that we are told the sensitivity is 0.7 and the specificity is 0.95. Um, these are roughly correct. The specificity is normally very high and the sensitivity is normally not as high. So let's assume that John uh, appears with no symptoms and James presents with fever and loss of taste both, and both of them test negative. What are the probabilities that these are false negatives? So they both test negative and what they're really concerned about is could I still have the virus? Um, so again, we work out the probability of infection, and it was by the 4th of May when I was writing this, 
1 over 169, which is 0 0.0059. So these are the low priors that will affect the results. So if you write, put in uh, all the different probabilities for the model, you get this below. And if you work out what the probability is that you're infected, given that you've tested negative, you find that it's 2%. So it's extremely low. So um, you're pretty confident there's not a false negative and John doesn't have the virus. So John doesn't have to worry. After testing negative, the doctor will say, well, there's a, only a 2% probability that this could be a false negative and John will be happy. Now, when James pr presents with uh, typical COVID sim symptoms, so a rough estimate for him, and I'm not saying how you work out this estimate, might be since he has these symptoms, he is not going to have a probability of infected B, which is equal to the, the normal prevalence, 0 0.0059. The doctor may assume that, well, it's probably about 0.8. And if that's the case, then given that he's tested negative, his probability of uh, being infected or his probability of a false negative now jumps up to 59%. So you can see the probability of false negative depends on the priors. And unfortunately, what happens in the media, they don't discuss that. They simply talk about specificity or sensitivity. So that's the end of part two, uh, sections two and three. And we're going to now continue to part three, which contains uh, sections four and five.